Welcome to Feminist Question Time. It's brought to you by Women's Human Rights Campaign, the leading global organisation defending women's sex-based rights against the threats posed by gender identity ideology. There's more information on our website, womensdeclaration.com, where you'll find our Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights, which has been signed by 20,610 people from 140 countries and is supported by 383 organisations. As well as signatories, we have activists in 52 countries um, worldwide engaged in defending women's rights. If you'd like to get involved, please fill in the form on our website. This week, unfortunately, I have very sad news from uh, South America that our country contact in Chile, Sofia Gonzalez, passed away in August after a long struggle with illness. She was with Women's Human Rights Campaign. She was the country contact for Chile for over a year. And she spoke in one of on one of our very first Feminist Question Time webinars on the 16th of May, 2020. Some of our sisters in Chile went to her funeral and tell us that appearing on FQT was uh, very important to Sophia. This week on Feminist Question Time, we have the launch of Janice Raymond's new book, Double Think, a feminist challenge to transgenderism, uh, published by Spinifex Press. With Janice Raymond, Sheila Jeffries, Anna Zobnina, and the publishers Susan Hawthorne and Renata Klein. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Susan Hawthorne from Spinifex Press and uh, to introduce the book and Spinifex. Hello, uh, my name is Susan Hawthorne and I'm the uh, publisher at Spinifex Press, along with Renata Klein, who's the other publisher. We founded Spinifex in 1991, and we are a radical feminist press and have been publishing lots of books across fiction, poetry, nonfiction um, for 30 years. So this year is our 30th year. Um, In Australia, when we open events, we acknowledge, uh, we do an acknowledgement of country. We respectfully acknowledge the wisdom of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their custodianship of the lands and waterways. We're speaking today, Renata and I, from Juru country in far north Queensland. We also acknowledge the many women throughout history who have fought for women's freedom and the freedom of lesbians, often at the cost of their lives. If you want to go and and check out Spinifex, you can do it at www.spinifexpress.com.au. So I'm I'm so pleased that that we are publishing Doublethink, a feminist challenge to transgenderism. Historically, Jan knows more about this this subject than anyone else. Back in 2019, uh, when I was writing uh, a chapter on breaking the spirit of the women's liberation movement in my book, uh, Vortex, The Crisis of Patriarchy, I returned to read The Transsexual Empire with its intense scrutiny of the field back in 1979. The overwhelming uh, um, change that has occurred since then is that there's been this shift from mainly men undergoing transition Mm. to a huge uptake of young women, most of many of whom, probably most, uh, young lesbians having transitional hormone and surgical treatments. Um, Back in 2000, I was really grateful for the existence of the transsexual empire when I was a member of Melbourne's Women's Circus, which was set up to work with women who were survivors of sexual assault. In that year, a man applied to join the circus. His request was taken seriously, and despite many other reasons for denying him entry to the circus, it was discussed over months and months, and it resulted in a deep division, and a number of us decided to leave the circus at that time. Uh, I wrote an open letter to the members of the circus and I finished it with a copy of The Transsexual Empire by Janice Raymond, uh, should be purchased by the Women's Circus and lent out to members interested in reading about the view that 
trannies, as we call them in Australia, and women's organisations don't mix. I hope that in this time, uh, women confronted by the aggressive colonisation of transgenderism will take the opportunity to read Doublethink. And just one final thing, what I, one of the things I really love about Doublethink is its beautifully relaxed style. It is a fabulous book and we at Spinifex are very, very pleased to have it on our list. And I hope many of you will order a copy of Doublethink, share it, talk about it in groups, put it on courses and uh, discuss it with your friends. We're now going to um, go to Sheila Jeffries, who will introduce the book and uh, launch it. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jo. Uh, hello, sisters. It's uh, lovely to be able to speak with you today about uh, Janice Raymond's new book, Doublethink, for which all of us have been waiting with great anticipation. I'm going to talk mainly about the general importance of Janice's body of work, both to feminism and to me. Double Think is, think is the most recent work from her, but her contributions to feminism throughout her life so far have been extraordinary. Back in 1989, when her very significant and first book, The Transsexual Empire, The Making of the She-Male, was published, mm -hmm. I was heavily involved in radical, or as we called it, revolutionary feminist politics in London. We all read the book because we needed it so badly. We were fighting against the incursion of a few transvestites into women's events at that time. The great majority of UK radical feminists supported an entirely women-only politics, community and culture. And we had no doubt that the transvestites were men. They were not allowed in. Then Janice's book came out and we were absolutely thrilled. It was so well researched and written and really exposed the trans-industrial complex that created this problem we are having. Jan's book might have been controversial with the early transvestite rights movement in the US, but it was well supported by feminists and swathes of the medical profession, who also believed at that time that cutting up a man's body and putting him on hormones was an unethical response to mental distress. The very well-known and respected radical psychiatrist Thomas Saz wrote a glowing review of it for the New York Times. His book, The Myth of Mental Illness, published in 1961, which is little known now, was central to the ideas of the radical psychiatry movement, and to the feminist critique of the diagnosis and treatment of women's mental health that existed at that time and exists no more. Saz completely agreed with Jan's feminist analysis. His review was titled, Male and Female Created He, Them. It's an unfortunate biblical reference, but otherwise a headline which would be considered absolutely unacceptable in today's climate of radical indeterminacy. The book articulated our arguments. It was the first book critical of transvestism written by a feminist and pretty much the last until I wrote Gender Hurts in 2014. Jan was a philosopher of science and radical feminist philosophy was exactly what we needed. Jan forecast a good deal of what would take place. Though as she notes in Double Think, she could not have imagined quite how far the transsexual empire would go in transforming and dominating policy, language, and culture all over the world by the time this new book was written. In the late 70s in London, there were just two transvestites that I knew of creating trouble, not the thousands demanding their sexual interests be serviced by a massive social transformation that is happening now. But Jan could see into the future. She knew the empire would have huge effect, just not quite how much. In Doublethink, Jan gives a clear and alarming picture of just how far the empire has gone, and in this sense provides an excellent bookend to her first tour de force. I have been lucky enough to have a long association with Jan since I first met her in the US in 1986. I went out to spend a year teaching at a college in Central in Worcester, Massachusetts, as a Fulbright scholar from 1985 to 6. I sent out letters before I went to those US rad femmes who were my inspiration, including Andrea Dworkin, Catherine McKinnon, Adrian Rich, and Janice Raymond. 
Jan is one of that quite small number of US radical feminists who informed and inspired us over the pond in the UK. The UK did not have radical feminist stars or the wonderful books of radical feminist theory they produced. I was in awe of these radical lesbian feminists and certainly in awe of Jan when she agreed to meet with me. I was thrilled to discover that she'd already read my first book, The Spencer and Her Enemies. I saw myself as a newcomer, lucky to meet with the established leaders of the movement. Then Jan wrote her next book, The Wonderful Passion for Friends, which I hope we will be discussing soon in the Radfem Perspective series, which takes place on Sunday mornings. A Passion for Friends, a philosophy of female friendship from 1986, is a much loved work of lesbian feminist theory. Fascinating and so positive about our lesbian lives. I met Jan again when she came to the UK to promote the book. An indication of the significance of that book for the feminist movement in the UK is the fact that it was named the best nonfiction book of the year by the UK alternative magazine, City Limits. In 1987, Jan and I both spoke at a very important conference in New York at the New York University Law School, organized by New York Women Against Pornography. It was called The Sexual Liberals and the Attack on Feminism to encapsulate its purpose, which was to fight back against the great backlash being waged against anti-pornography and anti-sexual violence radical feminism by liberal feminists and gay male sadomasochists and lefty sexual revolutionaries. The forces of male domination were being marshaled powerfully at that time against those of us, and there were many of us, who were campaigning against pornography in the US and the UK. Speakers at the conference included Jan, Andrea Dworkin, Phyllis Chesler, Catherine McKinnon, and Mary Daly. I was the only non-American. The papers became the 1990 book of the same name, which is available to download online. At the conference, Jan articulated her sharp critique of liberal feminism in a talk entitled Sexual and Reproductive Liberalism. We radical feminists were at that time under a battering onslaught of liberal feminism, which poo-pooed all our work against pornography and much of that against sexual violence too. The liberal feminists were saying that it was empowering for women to be able to choose to be in pornography, prostitution or surrogacy or baby trafficking. All these forms of violence and abuse of women were turned into their opposite. They were subjected to what Mary Daly called a patriarchal reversal as women's pain and exploitation were promoted as wonderful opportunities for women. Jan's critique of liberal choice feminism in all her work has been critical, hugely useful to other scholars or um, to other scholars today. Some of the talks from that wonderful conference I had on a cassette tape, which we were allowed to purchase at the event, and these are online. I'm hoping that all of the talks I did not have, including Jan's two presentations, are under some woman's bed and will also make it into an online archive. My political development into anti-prostitution politics meant that I would have the pleasure of working with Jan in the 1990s when she was involved in running the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women, and I set up the Australian branch of that organization. Jan was a director of CATWA from 1994 to 2007 and is still on the board. CATWA expanded hugely internationally during this time and has been of critical importance in spreading the understanding that prostitution is violence against women and opposing the legalization of the sex industry. I was involved in this work from setting up the Australian branch in 1994 to when I left Australia in 2015. It was my pleasure to be able to speak on panels with Jan on prostitution in Korea, for instance. We have both published books on prostitution and on transgenderism. Jan's book, Not a Choice, Not a Job, Exposing the Myths About Prostitution was published in 2013. We have both experienced considerable harassment during our work on prostitution because there is a crossover between pro-prostitution and pro-transgender activists. Jan describes some of the attempts to prevent her doing her anti-prostitution work by activists against both SWERFs, sex worker exclusionary radical feminists, and TERFs, transgender exclusionary radical feminists, 
in a chapter describing the woeful campaign to exclude her books and those of other radical feminist anti-violence against women works, and including my own, from libraries and universities, for instance, as well as the forms of very serious harassment that many feminist academics, researchers, writers, and activists have been subjected to. There are important crossovers between prostitution and transgenderism, such as the way in which young boys and men internationally are effeminized so that they can be used in prostitution, such as the Fa'afafine in Samoa, lady boys in Thailand, Hijra in India. But these connections are never discussed critically. Anti-prostitution activists continue to face the joined up attacks on us as swerfs and turfs. My path and, and Jan's path have run along similar tracks. We've both been very proud lesbian feminists and activists against prostitution and written books about that, as well as working against the transsexual empire. And this is not coincidental. Radical feminists like us have always understood and worked against the use and abuse of women's bodies that lies at the basis of male domination in prostitution, pornography, and surrogacy. Jan has written against the abuse and exploitation of women in the reproductive technology industry as well as the trafficking in women that's involved in surrogacy in her book, Women as Wounds, Reproductive Technologies and the Battle Over Women's Freedom, which was published in 1993 and by Spin Effects in 1995. Caring about women's bodies, women's, women's natural bodies, as Jan puts it, is something that is reject, rejected by liberal feminism. Jan's critique of liberal choice feminism in all her work has been critical. Jan and I both care very much about the exploitation of women's fleshly bodies, and Jan's voice on these issues is of huge importance. I remember back in 1996 speaking, seeing and hearing Jan at the conference Violence, Abuse and Women's Citizenship, which was organized by Jan Ahanma and held on a, in a seafront hotel in Brighton. We were both speaking. I remember well that I said to Jan, I went up to her and said after she had spoken that she had a wonderful moral authority in her speaking. And she replied to the effect that I did too. So I was very well surprised and pleased that she should think so. That conference I understand to have been the last to take place before the rapid decline of the women's liberation movement got underway. I know too that all the found recordings of the talks given there under her bed or in the cellar or somewhere and that they will at some point be available for us to hear again. At this time, we are at a very important point in the struggle against the transsexual empire. Jan states in her book that it isn't a sequel, but it does, however, make an ex excellent job of describing the most disturbing effect of the empire's power, particularly the effect upon lesbians who are being transgendered in uh, who are being transgendered in a detailed chapter on lesbian issues. She includes the harassment and sexual violence against lesbians by men who pretend to be lesbians to gain sexual access. This previously little known issue has come to prominence in the UK just in the last week with the publication by BBC News of a lengthy article describing the problem supported by Angela Wilde's research, research which Jan also uses. The backlash to the BBC for that article was swift with 10,000 people writing to complain that the preference that lesbians have for women rather than men is transphobic and like racism. But the BBC held firm. Double Think is a most welcome book for Janice's friends and admirers who are legion in the radical feminist community. Once, back at the time of the women's liberation movement, we would await with huge eagerness the next volume that one of the wonderful radical feminist theorists of that time would produce. Jan is one of the very few still to be writing, and it is good that our patience has been rewarded with this book. I have been thinking since we've been talking, and Jan talks very much in her book, about the, the crucial importance of detransitioners. And I was thinking that, you know, a few years ago, when I did Gender Hurts, I was telling people that I thought there were two, th two things that would change the success of these men. One would be a movement of detransitioners, and that is now happening, and that's really, really important, because in the end, they cannot be ignored. And the other was a movement by 
um, the trans widows, as they now tend to be called, that is the women who've been married to these men, because these are, these are two constituencies of women that have been absolutely hugely harmed. Um, and back in you know, 2014, I couldn't find anything about the wives. I found only one detransitioner to talk to. It was very hard in those days. Uh, and it's, it's quite different now. Um, and there's the Trans Widows website online. Lots of women are speaking out. They have got no coverage in the media, though. Detransitioners have. They've got out there. We see stuff about detransitioners. We don't see anything yet about the trans widows. And I'm hoping this is really gonna change because there are huge, huge numbers of them. When you look at the comment threads um, in Mumsnet and other places, you know, women all the time are coming out and saying, yes, my husband did that and my partner did that. Uh, and it was enormously in common. And indeed, a boyfriend of mine way back in the dark old days when I was briefly heterosexual, also I know dressed up in, um, clothes of mine, which he left out on the bed to show me. So this is enormously common. It's a huge problem for women, and that needs to come out. But I'm very, very pleased that we've got as far as we have with detransitioners, I have to say. In relation to transgenderism um, and prostitution, it's really, I think, is it not only those two areas in which we have had huge protests against feminists and violence against feminists and the men really coming out against us. I don't think there's any other issue. And of course, in the old days, they didn't care about us anyway. So the men are becoming violent now in a way that they never, ever did. But it's interesting that it's those two issues. So it's, I'm, I'm not quite sure exactly how they're joined up, but there's a way in which those two issues are obviously enormously threatening to the project of male domination. Um, it's just interesting that it is those two, and those of us who've been active in both of those areas, as I have, as Jan has, we see these, um, these men come together in very violent ways, and we have suffered from both of them. But it's just interesting how those things work together. For this exciting launch of Doublethink, a feminist challenge to transgenderism, I have chosen to read parts of chapter four, the trans culture of violence against women. Transgender activists, many who are self-declared women, that is men, have invented a new equation. Violence equals the misgendering or mispronouning of any trans identified person. As one trans activist tweeted, quote, intentional misgendering is violence and should be met with violence. In this view, violence is not mainly physical aggression or assault, but rather words that trans activists find objectionable. Conflating misgendering and mispronouning with actual physical violence diminishes the meaning of rape, woman battering, and other forms of physical harm and frees its perpetrators from any accountability. Actual violence loses its meaning. If anyone questions any tenet of transgender ideology, it is called violence against trans identified persons. If parents question the prescribing of dangerous puberty blockers and cross sex hormones given to their children, that is called violence against trans children who are being denied needed medical care. If lesbians or other gender critical women refuse the sexual overtures of natal men who claim to be lesbians, that is called violence against trans lesbians. A self-declared woman, that is a man, can engage in the worst kind of threats and violence against feminist critics. But any woman who speaks out against trans dogmas is accused of hate speech. Any questioning of trans truths invites threats and violence against women who are smeared as TERFs, that is women who are labeled as trans exclusionary radical feminists. The trans invented term of TERF invites violence against feminists 
and other women who won't get with the transgender program. The trans branding of women as TERFs is itself a form of hate speech that attempts to dishonor gender critical women and provoke compliance with the demands of trans activists. On social media, the ever present threat of violence against women is perpetrated by trans activists who have become experts in the classic art of re reversal. That is the act of making someone change to its opposite. For example, in trans world, women become perpetrators, not victims of male violence. Turf is a slur and its use has enabled enormous levels of bullying, abuse and violence against women especially in trans activist tweets that appear on social media. Two of the most frequent trans refrains are kill all TERFs and punch TERFs, as if punching and killing are games in which one player tries to surpass the other in viciousness. These tweets pervade sites like Twitter and other social media. They are incitements to violence used by perpetrators who employ bullying and intimidation as their weapons. Even when actual violence is threatened, social media companies do not take seriously the posts that target women, such as, I kill bitches like you, unquote. Instead, the posts are passed off as controversial humor rather than as incitements to violence against women. Companies like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube host such harassment, claiming they are not the arbiters of people's free speech. Yet they forcefully intervene when feminists post transcritical messages online. They have censored and canceled feminist accounts Twitter permanently shuttered feminist publisher Megan Murphy's account after she referred to a self-declared woman as him. Many will excuse this kind of menacing behavior as the blather of vocal trans activists, but this kind of intentional unawareness encourages those who should know better from condemning these venomous tweets. Those who plead ignorance can hide behind the smokescreen of free speech, or they dismiss trans Twitter harassment as acceptable because it is only empty threats. When women are the targets of these tweets of trans activists, women don't experience this misogyny as an empty threat. As Andrea Dworkin has written, most women have experienced enough dominance from men that no threat seems empty. Appeasers will claim that trans violence against natal women is a small part of the trans community. But this claim is belied by the actual numbers of trans activists who reveal their true hatred of women, blatantly displayed on social media. Those who would attack and censor feminist critics are not just outliers in the trans community. Gender critical lesbians have been especially subjected to the fiber threats, cyber threats, harassment and bullying of women. In 2018, a group of lesbian activists organized a peaceful action at the Pride March in London, carrying banners and distributing leaflets with the slogan, get the L out out of the forced marriage of LGBT. The backlash against the pride action included threats and demonization of the lesbian feminist activists who organized the action. The most violent reaction came from, transgen from uh, the Manchester pride organizer, Tony Cooper, who outrageously asserted that the protesters should have been dragged out of the march by their saggy tits. This is the kind of hate mongering that lesbians experience. 
Much of the worst violence against lesbians and gender critical women comes from the various flavors of trans and gender non-binary men who move in LGBT affinity groups. Many young lesbians socialized it in these groups, but have never been exposed to lesbian feminism. Their trans friends and acquaintances, most of them self-declared women, pressure them for sex, intimidating them into saying yes. And what these young women learn from mingling with the LGBT crowd is never to use the word lesbian, never mind feminist, to describe themselves, lest they too be branded as TERFs. Men who self-declare as lesbians with their alleged lady sticks relentlessly hassle young women into believing it is discriminatory to set sexual boundaries. When writer and author Max Robinson, a young lesbian whose book Spin Effects has published, mixed in the LGBT community, and after several of her friends were raped or beaten by these men, she began to recognize that trans and queer ideologies impair women's ability to name what is happening and to disregard their own sexual abuse. Robinson said, there is no way to be lesbians in, this, in that scene. If you're a lesbian, you have to fuck trans women. And if you don't want to fuck trans women, then you're evil. They will come right after you. And it wasn't just a few. There were a lot of trans women acting that way. The Lesbians at Ground Zero report quantified the trans violence against women in these groups and named the sexual exploitation for what it is. 56% of the respondents in the study said they were pressured or coerced to accept a trans woman as a sexual partner. The report confirmed that many of the young women's experience experiences classify as rape, although were not named as such. The survey confirmed that lesbians have been subjected to a, a wide variety of sexual violence by men who identify as trans women or gender non-binary. The LGBT culture of violence against women prompted writer Kitty Robinson to collect personal accounts of women who could speak candidly about their sexual abuse and in some cases to out their predators. She produced an anthology entitled, You Told Me You Were Different, now published as a book. The topic was the harmful ways that male people who identify as trans treat female people within the, clear, within the queer and or trans community. The title captures the belief that these men, most who identified as women or gender non-binary, purported to be different rather than the very models of male sexual entitlement and abuse that they turned out to be. The report documented the whitewashing of rape and other sexual violence that victims experienced. Female victims of male violence in LGBT culture, where the women identified as lesbians, trans men, or gender non-binary, all write about the ways in which they were lured by men's claims of being distinctly different from abusive straight men and about the harms victims experienced. Men who perpetrated the violence identified as trans women or as trans lesbians or as gender non-conforming, all claimed to be different, but committed the same violence against women in the same ways that other men do. In Double Think, I excerpted selected quotes from the You Told Me You Were Different anthology. All are appalling tes testimonies of harm. <clears throat> For example, L.E.W., a contributor, writes, 
pressure, control, manipulation, threats, lies, a hand raised, then lowered, raised again, screaming at my flinching, telling me he wished I dressed like a real girl so he could borrow my clothes. Inebriated rages, then sober ones, ignoring my no, forcing my legs open. Anonymous writes, the last time I saw you, you slapped me across the face because it aroused you and choked me in the most dangerous way because it aroused you. The last time you told me how you had masturbated to the idea of raping me because it aroused you. What an ideal victim I must have been, a young woman with years worth of sexual trauma. I have finally found myself and reclaimed my lesbian sexuality. These young women, many who declared themselves trans men, came to these LGBT circles with all the baggage of female vulnerabilities. In spite of their male and gender conforming identities, all were treated as women to exploit. Whereas the male abusers who are self-declared women or non-binary behaved with all the oppressive behavior of predatory men who seek to confuse and abuse women. Unfortunately, many people want to see no evil, hear no evil. There is a deafening code of silence about the misogyny of trans activists and a painful lack of response, especially from progressive men and women to challenge rampant trans tyranny at women's events and on social media. Too many bystanders are looking the other way and are allowing trans violence against women to spread, whether in words or in deeds. Well, first of all, I would like to thank both, both Spinifex and the WHRC women who have made this launch possible. I also want to thank Sheila and Anna for their very generous remarks about my book. In closing, I guess, or in, in approaching uh, the end of this, this launch, I will add a few words about what makes me optimistic about the future. And that is the young women who are desisting and detransitioning from their past masculine gender identities. Some of that I quoted in the recording that you heard, but they are writing not only about their experiences or violence in the LGBT community movement, but they are also confronting the double think of transgenderism on websites, podcasts, webinars, and in public testimonies and other media. For over 30 years, I worked to combat the sexual exploitation and trafficking of girls and women. I have spoken with hundreds of women in systems of prostitution who have testified that it is not a choice and not a job. It is sexual exploitation. In writing this book, I have learned that there are lots of instructive parallels in the testimonies of survivors of prostitution and survivors of transgenderism. Detransitioners are the survivors of trans violence against women. Many young men who have experienced male violence against women in their so-called trans affinity groups from men who identify as women are now detransitioning and telling us that they have rejected a system that has kept them in a situation of sexual exploitation. We have seen the global prostitution survivor movement take a leading role in the campaign to end prostitution. Likewise, in spite of everything that we have, we know, 
I do have optimism about the impact that detransitioning women will make as they begin to write about their journeys of returning to their selves. Trans activists have taken their ideology and practice to absurd lengths and people have played along with it. We are in the group, grip of a repudiation of reality that is responsible for much harm. And principled people must be willing to speak out and say enough. I hope that more people will come to see gender dissatisfaction, not as a disorder requiring medical treatment or as a matter of self-identification, but as an issue that will not be resolved until we challenge both the traditional and progressive gender defined cultures and also the denialism that perpetuates them. Thank you. So we're going to now hear from Anna Zognina. She's from Russia. She's born in St. Petersburg, Russia, and currently lives in Scotland. She's policy coordinator for European Network of Migrant Women. She's going to give some feedback on the new book and some general thoughts. So welcome, Anna, and over to you. It is not easy for me to respond to a new piece of work and a book written by someone as big, as prominent, as pioneering and visionary as Janice Raymond. And I have to say that I was a little surprised with the invitation to respond to the book, as it is very obvious to me that a lot of women, including many women in this webinar today, with many more years of experience and much more knowledge, would be perhaps better placed to give a response and review of the new book of Janice Raymond. For me, it is important to acknowledge that and to also recognize that my understanding and my reading and the feedback to the book comes from my specific experience that has been shaped um, in the areas of work where I'm engaged. And one of them is known as a policy work, but also my focus of my work with migrant and refugee women and the area of advocacy for the abolition of prostitution and male violence in general. So it is these experiences uh, that give me a specific outlook on individuals who work in the NGO world and academia that often overlaps with the NGO world and the policy sector at the European and some extent international level. And because of my personal exposure to these environments of policy world, NGO, and academia, I have come to place a very specific value in the qualities of moral integrity and intellectual coherence, which are a rare sight in those environments. I think at a very basic human level, it is difficult enough to maintain those qualities for anyone, it is much more difficult to maintain them when you are an academic, when you are involved in managing a large international human rights organization. And it is also very challenging to maintain them when in the eyes of the common people, you belong to a movement that calls itself feminism. I'm saying this because in these environments, it is not uncommon in my experience for women to lose sight of priorities, to be swayed by public opinion or pressure groups, to compromise in order to sustain one's organization or one's career, or make some very pragmatic choices to survive. And I'm saying this because for me, Janice Raymond and her intellectual and academic work, her policy work and her activism as well, represent this kind of integrity coherence and consistency over a considerable period of time. Um, in the double thing, Janice Raymond says, this book is not the transsexual empire number two, but it could not have been written without number one. And for me, it feels like knowing Janice's work uh, and the qualities of her work including 
a, a huge amount of work done to abolish the system of prostitution and male violence. So knowing this, I would say as well that how I, I feel about this book, that the transsexual empire, <laughs> number one, could not have been without this book, The Double Thing, that came kind of complete the cycle that Janice opened with the publication of <clears throat> Transsexual Empire. Again, in The Double Thing, Janice says, in 1979, I wrote that men cannot become women or women men. I personally found it always very interesting to note that the publication of Transsexual Empire coincided with the adoption of CEDAW Convention. It's the same time period, 78, 79, 80s, the early 80s. And CEDAW is the, known as the International Bill on Women's Rights and the only international convention that sets in writing the standards for substantive equality for women and protection of women from sex-based discrimination. Now, of course, those standards could be much higher. We all know that. We know that CEDAW is not very strong on violence against women, for example, but whether we like it or not, this is the only international instrument right now that protects women from discrimination done against us because we are women. So I also can't not notice that it is the same year, 1978, when I was born. So for me, those two publications, <laughs> Transsexual Empire and the adoption of CEDO, they quite literally mark my birth. So that's my entire lifespan. And for me, thinking retrospectively, it is fascinating and terrifying to look where we are as women's rights movement globally today, how much of what was said in the first book of Janice has become reality, and how much set in CEDO has become a kind of fantasy. Not everything, but quite a lot of it. And where the whole international discussions on the standards of women's rights have moved. Um, Janice again writes, looking ahead from 1979, I envisioned that the few university and hospital-based gender identity centers treating adult transsexuals would grow and become sex role control centers for female and male children who deviated from traditional sex roles. And this is exactly where we are today. We are, and we are in crisis. Speaking more about the book itself, and I think Janice makes it very clear in the introductory parts that the book has, um, it, uh, it, it has two di dimensions or two uh, types of readerships, if, if you want. Um, so one of them, how, how I, I saw it, is, is the feminists themselves, of course, those women who have been actively involved in protecting women and girls' rights, protecting women and girls from being erased from law, language, whether they're radical feminists or abolitionist feminists or gender critical feminists, a lot of them will find themselves in the book. So for this kind of readership of informed women, the book offers, I think, a number of important and I would say much weighted clarifications. Uh, for example, the position and the analysis and the speculations around it of Andrea Dworkin on the issue of transgenderism. It also points out very clearly at some of the traps in which it is very easy to be caught for a number of reasons, such as the demand for the feminists to differentiate between the extremists and the moderate majority of the trans movement. It also points out at the danger of idealizing those few individuals, both men and women, who identify as transgender, but not the opposite sex. And they are critical of both self-declaration of sex and trans movement. On this, Janice says in the book, I welcome the perspective of those trans-identified women or men who recognize the dangers of self-declaration. I appreciate the public statements they make. 
But I also question why some gender critical trans identified persons do not recognize and discuss their own supporting roles in generating this current trans movement. I also appreciate Janice's honesty and her uh, rigorous approach to language um, and her clarification that she will not use in this book the required pronouns. And uh, at the same time, this book offers a very thorough documentation of what has been happening, mostly in Anglophone world, which is important because all of this came from the Anglophone world in the first place. And it pays a tribute to radical feminists, to radical feminist analysis and thought, and gives a pan-Arabic view and as I said, a thorough documentation of diverse and crucial areas in which women's rights and human rights in general are being impacted and eroded. It also speaks about the masses of work done by women, by feminists, by radical feminists to oppose this attack on women's rights and the impact that these women, most of whom are radical feminists, have sustained while continuing their work. So I think this book is an important reminder and an exercise in maintaining the integrity, the coherence, intellectual honesty, while very importantly, giving credit to the women for their work. So as such, I think it's a wonderful gift to the community, to the feminist community. At another level, and again, Janice makes it clear that this book is not only for radical feminists, and I hope that it will not be only for radical feminists, and it should be and hopefully will be read by ordinary women and perhaps some men and girls and general public who may not be familiar uh, with a lot of what is going on in this field. And in this sense, I think the book uh, can be grouped together with a number of other publications, I won't name them, but we all know that there have been several books published recently on the subject of transgender activism and ideology and impact on women's rights or freedom of speech. Um, and for those readers, the book offers, again, the documentation, the mappings of abuses and tactics in the area of girls and women's uh, basic rights to safety, bodily integrity, media, including social media, legal, educational, sport, medical, academic sectors, freedom of speech and assembly. But of course, I have to say that this book is very different from other publications because it is written by an expert who was the pioneer in this area. It is written by a woman who decided that, who, who dedicated her entire career and her life to defend women and girls from male violence, in particular sexual violence. It is written by a person with extensive experience working internationally, a teacher, an academic, a writer, who has applied her work beyond academia, beyond raising awareness and organizing conferences, but also coordinating and working on the programs from which the most discriminated women have benefited in concrete terms. And as Jenny says herself, one of the goals of this book is to amplify the voices of women who have been harmed by the double thing of transgenderism and to recognize them as survivors of male sexual violence, many of whom identified as trans men, gender non-binary or queer. This will be my general feedback to the book. And I know that Jenny's writes, um, she, uh, she, 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 she says that um, at the time when book burning continues, I, as, as I write, uh, and she wonders if the double thing will be another victim relegated to the index of forbidden books, at least historically banned uh, by Roman Catholic Church. And yes, we know it will be. And I hope we are all ready um, to make it more difficult for the new church of transgender ideology to burn this book 
to ban this book and to invisibilize this. Thank you. I'm now going to hand over to Renata Klein. She's the publisher, along with Susan Hawthorne, of Spinifex Press. Over to you, Renata. So first, the thank yous. I mean, the biggest thank yous, of course, are to Chen. Um, for the last, I don't know, two, three, four, five, <laughs> six years, Chen and I sort of have been talking about, um, is there going to be another book? And she said, oh, I don't know if I should. And all the abuse that will has come my way will come my way. But yes, then she started to write. And then she wrote actually really quickly. And then she said, now, this book has to be out this year. And we said, oh, my goodness me, this year. Because we had thought that because Janice had said, oh, well, I'm writing. It will be a next year book. But I think it is really the time to get this book out. And as um, I think Anna mentioned before, there have been some other books uh, by Kathleen Stock and by Helen Joyce. And um, with Jan's book, they make for really important reading uh, for girls, for women, for feminists, but also hopefully for that mass of people who basically says, oh, yes, 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 we agree, we agree, but we can't say anything. We can't say anything because it is too dangerous. And to all of these people, I think, all of you here today on this panel, and I'm sure a lot of the uh, women who are listening to this now will say, we have to be brave and we have to speak out. We just cannot hide and hope it will just pass. It will only pass if there is a mass movement to make it pass. And I think the UK at the moment is the best place where the most of the these movements uh, on this uh, wonderful gender critical radical feminists lesbians are actually uh, you know moving some big mountains but there is more mountains to be moved so going back to the thank you so we're very pleased very proud and very thankful to Jan for writing this book the book <coughs> was really a pleasure to edit there were no dramas everybody was perfect model author and um, model editors, I should say, of course, and I want particularly want to thank Pauline Hopkins. I don't know if she's here. It's a bit late in Australia, as you know, it's past well past one o'clock in the morning, um, who um, together with Susan and me edited Jan's book. Not that it needed a lot of edits, but everybody makes mistakes. <coughs> and there is one mistake, and I might as well say that and spare you writing to us. There is one mistake which has already been corrected mostly. And that is the wonderful Nikki Craft. Uh, Craft's name has a K in the book. And of course, we all know it should have a C. So we managed already to correct that in ebooks and PDFs. And the printed copies, please buy heaps of copies so we can reprint really fast and we will correct it. Secondly, I want to really thank the uh, Deb Snipson for the wonderful cover. Covers are always difficult, uh, but this one, this cover came about really fast. We briefed the designer as we always do, and she almost immediately came up with this very intriguing um, pattern, which is really a bit like double sync in the very um, movement of the cover. So I want to thank her. Inside the book that probably a lot of you haven't seen, it's also very beautifully typeset by Helen Christie, who really uh, copes with our you know, late night, oh no, we found another mistake, please correct things. Then the other members of the Spinifex team, and I really need to say we are a team, we couldn't do it without a single one of them, are Marilyn Damiano, our office manager, Sharon Murphy, our warehouse manager, the very wonderful uh, Rachel uh, McDermish, uh, who is our promotions person, and Caitlin Roper, who does everything to do with social media, uh, from Facebook to Twitter and Instagram and whatever. Um, we are expecting, of course, that we will be attacked. We have been attacked a little bit, but so far, 
um, it has actually been surprisingly um, mild. And of course, that is also one way to kill a book by not mentioning it. it somebody mentioned that before, I think, Anna. Uh, one way of not making noises about a book is to invisibilize it. And so, you know, we are a small publisher. We are on the other side of the world, although we do distribute our books in North America and Euro Europe and UK. And if you go on the Spinif website, um, there is a page that says order and you can go there and see where you can actually get your book or you can order from us. So I really, really would like you, all of you who are listening today, and not just to buy copies, tell your libraries, tell your bookshop to order it. That's really important. And then like somebody said that Helen Joyce's book, for instance, is not to be seen in the bookshop in the front. We'll go in and say, where is Janice Raymond's book and why is it not in the front? And, and um, Helen Joyce's book and Kathleen Stock's book, they all need to be at the front. And they all need to be read. And I'm sure we, most of us will know about this week's event that Kathleen Stock actually resigned from Sussex University because the attacks on her and her family have just been too much for her. I feel personally very sorry about that since the university seems to have been supportive of her. Um, but, you know, if they attack your family, then that is really a bit much. So, um, make a lot of noise about double sync. And sorry, I think I didn't mention Susan Hawthorne, who of course is the most important person of the spin effects team because without Susan, probably not very much would happen. Um, but um, so thank you, Susan.